Holly Bick. I'm um, an assistant professor at UC Riverside down in Southern California. So I'm uh, the second scientist up here today. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about work that I've been doing related to visualizing environmental sequencing data sets. And this is a framework called Finch, which I'll get to in a little bit. So to give you a brief background about my research, so um, I am, I'm actually a taxonomist by training. So I did my PhD sitting at the microscope uh, at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, my research focuses on microbial eukaryotes. So these are microscopic uh, metazoan organisms that are present pretty much in every um, handful of sand, mud, soil that you would pick up and hold in your hand. Uh, and you can't see them. Uh, we don't really know much about the diversity globally of these kind of things, but we know that there's a lot of microscopic taxa that live in soils and sediments. So my research is really focusing on filling this, this gap in our knowledge of um, things that are not too big, but also not too tiny. So the majority of research um, tends to focus either on bacteria, because the, historically bacteria have been um, subjected to molecular biology for a lot longer, and then large, big, fuzzy things like t tigers and pandas and things that have an obvious public appeal to them. Um, but I'm going to focus on the, the less cuddly creatures, I suppose. So my background is nematode worm taxonomy, and nematodes are these, um, these electron microscopy pictures down here. So they're about uh, a millimeter in length, and they look like specks of dust if you were to see them uh, with the naked eye on a glass slide. But there's a huge diversity of, um, of species, of morphologies, of, of genetic, um, uh, just genetic groups of these organisms. And so historically, if we wanted to study um, microbes, microbial eukaryotes, we would do taxonomy. So this is what I was trained in. This is what a lot of uh, scientists, biologists still continue to do. So they sit at the microscope, they, um, we mount an eyelash on a glass rod, and we sit at the microscope and we actually look at the eyelash um, uh, through, through the lenses, and we're picking, uh, we're basically trying to hook worms on the tip of the eyelash and transfer them to different um, tubes and plates and, and slides and things like that. And then when we, when we mount slides, we, we look at the morphology, so we're trying to draw different features. So we're trying to draw um, head shapes and tail shapes and uh, sensory pores and all these different anatomical features which have been historically useful in trying to differentiate species. So that's historically the way that we did things. Uh, no molecular data, obviously. But now things are different. So now we have genomic technologies, and we have this amazing capacity to sequence hundreds of millions of DNA sequences from a handful of sand. So we don't necessarily have to pick out the organisms anymore. We can just chop up all the DNA and uh, sequence the DNA and get this 30 gigabyte text file of um, as essentially what looks like uh, dots of light if you were to look at a sequencer. So I always like to make this comparison that, you know, the scale of genomic data that we're dealing with currently is essentially equivalent to the amount of stars in space. And so this is actually a picture of, if you were to, uh, this is the Illumina sequencer, so it, it functions by looking at points of light, and that's how it sequences and incorporates spaces in the DNA sequencing, and it looks exactly like a picture of um, space from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the, the scale of the data we're dealing with is not inconsequential, and um, for biologists like me, who are, were sitting at the microscope five years ago, this is just completely overwhelming. So uh, we don't know how to deal with this massive, massive increase in, in data that's just pouring onto our hard drives every day. So to do genomic studies of microbial taxa, we do what's called environmental omics. So this is referred to as environmental sequencing or metagenomics or metabarcoding. There's different names for it. But essentially, it's a similar process to what you would do if you were to collect samples for taxonomy. So you would still go out into your environment. You would uh, collect your samples. So in my case, I tend to go to the beach. I tend to collect sand. I go on boats. We send down coring equipment to collect sediments. And then we put that into bottles or bags, and we bring it back to the lab. Um, for my work, we isolate the organisms, so we're using um, a process of what's called decanting and sieving. So we're, we're separating the sediment from the organisms themselves. And um, if we were to do taxonomy, we'd then look at the micros under the microscope and try to pick things out. But nowadays, uh, if we're doing environmental sequencing workflows, we're just going straight to the DNA extraction part. So we're not, no longer looking at the organisms anymore under the microscope. We're just assuming that their DNA is there, because it always is, usually. 
And then we'll go on to do something like uh, amplify uh, a, a DNA barcode region that we know is informative for our understanding of evolution and species relationships within that group. So you'll hear, um, if, if you know anything about these studies, you'll hear the, the phrase ribosomal RNA a lot. So everything has ribosomes. Ribosomes are the powerhouse or the, um, you know, basically they make all the proteins in the cell. So the, the gene that makes the ribosome is really conserved and it doesn't change much in evolutionary terms. So we tend to use that gene because everything has it. Um, and then after we do our lab work, um, we go on to sequence those, uh, the DNA sequences which we've generated. Nowadays we're using Illumina sequencers, uh, it used to be 454 and obviously that keeps changing. And then the next step is we get our text file and then somehow as biologists we have to generate this pretty picture of species relationships over space and time and um, get something that we can put into a scientific publication because that's as scientists what we're sort of measured by as metrics. Um, but there is an obvious bottleneck in this process. So going from that sequence data, that text file, to getting that picture is very complicated. Uh, there's a bottleneck in terms of the amount of data that we have to deal with. Um, tools are getting better, but some tools are just not really set up to handle that amount of data. And there's also a bottleneck in terms of training. So as a taxonomist, I had to teach myself programming. I had to sit down and learn how to use the command line. And um, that's for motivated people, that's what we do, but not all biologists have that opportunity or will to actually get that training to be able to process these data sets. So the bottleneck is not just ter in terms of the tools, but it's also in terms of the people who are using the tools. Um, they might not actually be able to generate the picture to put in their publication even if they wanted to. So um, I'll, I'll suggest some solutions to that, but I just wanted to step back a second and, and remind everyone that taxonomy, you know, it sounds like this historic thing that we used to do, but it's actually a form of data visualization. So when we're sitting under the microscope, we are looking at a specimen which we mount on a slide, and we're using our eyes and our brains and our knowledge of that environment and our knowledge of those species to basically create hypotheses about our data sets. So uh, taxonomy is subjective, experts have different opinions, experts have um, better or worse skills for seeing different things. And um, we're fundamentally visualizing our data and we're comparing different anatomical structures to make assumptions and, and, and basically write our papers and, and figure out the biology, the biodiversity and the evolutionary re relationships of all of these organisms. But as we've moved away from morphological taxonomy and onto these high throughput genomic studies, we've really lost that visualization approach. And it's uh, extremely frustrating for taxonomists because they just feel completely overwhelmed. And now, instead of looking at nice images of worms and marveling at evolution and nature, we're, we're faced with these kind of boring in comparison text files of, um, of sequences, of um, OTUs, so we deal with operational taxonomic units, which are molecular species. Um, and essentially, we are trying to do computational taxonomy. So we can assign a name to DNA sequences using um, algorithms which match to databases and so we can sort of get a species name to attach to that DNA sequence but we really don't have any visual that corresponds that species name to anatomical structures. Um, so our fine scale visuals are really lost in most omics workflows nowadays and I think this is particularly critical for um, ecology studies and studies that are trying to replace or supplement those morphological historic taxonomic investigations. So what are we good at doing? So common visualizations that we can generate through these um, bioinformatics pipelines, and uh, you saw similar things in the previous talk, we're really good at showing overall patterns. So we can summarize our samples as dots, and that each dot is actually a, a corresponding to thousands of species potentially, but we've summarized it in a little data point. And we can look at the overall pattern, so we can look at the um, relationships between sample sites. We can color things according to different metadata. We can tell that the, the red and the blue samples seem to be very separate. And um, that's about it. So common visualizations that we have for environmental sequencing in, in, in biology and computational biology really are only good at showing overall patterns. And we know from, um, from an ecological perspective that there are a lot more uh, types of information that are buried in these data sets which we just can't pull out at the moment. 
And I want to drill this home even further to say that when we're doing this computational taxonomy and we're just getting text files with strings of, of information, species names are really meaningless without context. So I'm a taxonomist, and because of my background and training, I am getting information out of these strings of text that probably most people in the audience would not be able to infer. So I can look at a species name and I can get this image in my head of um, you know, what, the, what the head shape of, these are nematode worms by the way, what the head shape looks like, whether or not they have teeth. Um, I can tell, I can infer whether or not the species has potential microbial symbionts, so if they have any bacteria that are related to them. And then for C. elegans, for my data sets, I can tell that that's contamination because C. elegans doesn't live in the ocean, and if I have that in my data set, then someone in the lab has, has basically ruined my sample. So this is information that you really can't get unless you have that specialized training. And, and we're, we're, we're losing that information, but we're also not taking advantage of the fact that we do have people in the sciences that have this incredibly specialized knowledge. And so I make the comparison to uh, an art museum. So this is equivalent to if we went to all the art museums in the world and took away all the paintings and replaced the paintings with just strings of text. So uh, it would probably be a lot less enjoyable for people to visit art museums if this happened. Um, and we can describe paintings, you know, we can, we can paint a word picture, but it's just not the same as seeing the actual painting um, and having that experience with, with the data. So everyone has different reactions to visual information, like, like paintings and also like taxa, like species that we see under the microscope. And you have, um, you have a, a unique background, you have specialist knowledge perhaps, and you might be interpreting paintings uh, differently than, than I am. And that is very, very similar to what we have done in the past in, with morphological taxonomy. So the bottom line is how are we gonna deal with this um, overload of data and how are we actually going to go back to doing biology and getting ecological information when our data is just completely over overwhelming to the people with the most specialized knowledge who can take advantage of it. Um, so this is an example of actual data sets which we get from these pipelines. You know, we get JSON formatted files, we can convert it to Excel or a tab delimited file to make it easier for biologists to deal with it. But it's still an Excel file with 14,000 rows and no one wants to deal with that. So, um, so that's, that's fundamentally just what we're dealing with coming out of these high throughput sequencing genomics pipelines. So I want to make an argument here that we can solve this problem really easily, maybe not so easily, but we can solve this problem or make strides to it um, by using data visualization technologies, looking towards the future by really embracing the past. And by the past, I mean two things. So I mean, firstly, the human brain. So it's, it's sort of stupid if we think about it not to take advantage of this amazing thing in our heads, which has, is the product of six million years of evolution. So we have a visual co co cortex, we have pattern matching, and as scientists, we have not been very good at just um, developing tools which are just gonna sort of give the hard work over to our, our human brains to, to basically do what we have evolved to do. And secondly, um, the second part of that past is, is taxonomic knowledge. So we have 280 years of scientific effort since Linnaeus first developed his system of classifications. So we have species drawings, we have descriptions, and we have all this incredible work that is um, deposited in museums and institutions around the world. But for our intents and purposes, for people that work on computers, that information is, is effectively not there. So if it's offline, it's invisible, it's not accessible to be pulled into these sequencing pipelines that are really be, being done exclusively on computers. And taxonomic knowledge also includes the people themselves, these people that have careers focused on one particular thing and have this incredible specialist knowledge. So the proposed solution which I've been working with um, to, to, to basically deal with this problem is um, data visualization frameworks which will function on the data that you have in hand and allow you to quickly interact and explore with any type of data set that you might have generated from some of these sequencing technologies. So this is a framework called Finch. It was built in conjunction with a data visualization studio in Oakland um, called Pitch Interactive. And so the the project was funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the rationale was really to link up experts in data visualization, so the data visualization studio, with domain-specific experts, myself and other scientists who have specialist knowledge and are frustrated and kind of know what they want to do with the data set, but don't necessarily have the skills needed to, to develop these, these forward-looking pipelines um, and, and data visualization technologies. 
And this, the web, implement, uh, the web implementation is uh, at finch.org. It's live. Um, I'll show a screenshot, uh, a screencast, but um, there's a test file on the site if you wanted to interact with things yourself. So the great things about computational work is that, uh, and genomic data, is that it's, it's pretty standard as a format. So we can always rely on specific types of formats coming out of bioinformatics pipelines. So here we're leveraging what's called a, a biome format. So this is a biological observation matrix format, which is JSON formatted uh, text file. And you can really represent any type of data as, as this. So you can take um, microbial ecology data sets where you have molecular species clustered into operational taxonomic units. You can take metagenome data sets where you have contigs of genes that have been clustered. Um, and, and, and you can even take tab delimited files and convert them into JSON formatted files that can be gene variant data uh, basically anything that can be represented as a spreadsheet, you can convert. Um, and you can convert this data and also embed metadata that will be um, in, uh, important for interpreting your samples and, and looking at patterns and outliers. And the JSON, the biome file, file um, allows you to not only represent your data points, but also all the metadata that might be accompanying that data point. And it's really flexible. All right, so this is the framework itself. Um, it starts off with a, uh, a sort of minimalist homepage. Go back. So we start off with a minimalist homepage here, and the goal here is really to lower decision fatigue for scientists too, so you don't want them clicking all these buttons. You just want them to upload their data and then get into the visuals as quickly as possible. So this is... Um, Assuming some student or postdoc has, has formatted your file or you've got a file from a collaborator, you can just upload this directly um, in, in JSON format with the metadata embedded. And then you click load file. And then immediately you're taken into what's called a, what we're calling a parser window. So here you have a, um, basically everything that's in your, your file is just being immediately visualized. So this is all your samples in, in the center here. And then any type of metadata that you might have accompanying your sample. So this is sediment from an aquarium um, that we sequenced. And here we had collected all sorts of different environmental metadata like temperature, uh, time, we had a time series here. We have ammonia, nitrate, pH, salinity. Um, this is entirely flexible. So any sort of data that you want to put as metadata, you just put in that file and then on the fly, this visualization framework is, is parsing all that information and visualizing it in kind of a something like kayak.com or one of those flight websites. So you have slider bars. Um, you can, um, I don't have it here, but you can basically click uh, these plus signs. So if you wanted to only look at samples which have a narrow temperature range, you can, you can adjust those slider bars and the samples that meet that criteria will be updated in real time. Uh, and this is a framework that's built in, um, it's, it's built for use with the Google Chrome browser. So it's basically a collection of JavaScript libraries. It's leveraging um, IndexedDB and, and other JavaScript libraries which are inherently built into Chrome. And the reason why we focus on a web browser is because everyone knows how to use the internet. So if you, are, if you want a taxonomist or someone with no computational training to be able to use a framework, you need to have a software interface that is really accessible to them. Um, and so uh, the other thing is that no data is actually be senting, being sent over the internet. This is all happening on the fly. Um, so it's leveraging the databases in Chrome uh, to do all this on, on the client side. So on, on the user's computer, you don't have to worry about data privacy issues. You know, if you have a sensitive data set, you're not sending anything over the internet. It's, it's, the framework is all functioning locally. All right, so then you can proceed to gallery, and at the moment we have five visualizations which are implemented, and the, the goal here, so this is a prototype framework. It was built with a, a year-long prototyping grant from the Sloan Foundation. Um, and for the initial funding phase, we focused on visualizations which are pretty common, what, things that we thought scientists would like to see, and things that are typically included in, in scientific papers. Um, so, so the goal here was really just to make those visualizations interactive and exploratory and kind of soup them up and make them much better than the typical static tools which you would get out of other frameworks. So you don't want to have, you don't want to have to keep regenerating, going back to the command line, regenerating a static visual. You want to just be able to click around and really rapidly explore the patterns and filter your data sets. Um, so we'll go through them. So we have things like the taxonomy bar chart. Um, you can convert data from absolute to relative abundances. We have a taxonomic hierarchy up here. Oops, geez. I just skipped through my video. Skip ahead. 
too much. All right. Um, so you can go up and down the taxonomic hierarchies. So if we're talking about taxonomic data, you go from very broad kingdom, phylum, class. So you can get increasingly more fine scale by just the click of a button if you want to view things at the genus or species level, perhaps. Um, hovering over a sample will give you information about um, where that sample is found in data sets. We have bubble charts. So bubble charts are collapsing things according to the, um, the taxonomic strings or the metadata strings. And an autocomplete search box up here allows you to find anything specific which you might be looking for in the data set. And that's populated based on what's in your data set. So if you're trying to search for something and it's not showing up, then you know it's not in your data set. Um, you can click on bubbles so you can get more fine scale information about the distribution of species over, uh, sample, uh, over the samples that are in your data set. This is a Sankey diagram, so this is showing the breakdown of species going from kingdom on the left to, um, I think it went to order on the right, so you can show the break as things split out into more fine scale taxonomic hierarchies. That's sort of a, a visualization there. We have other visualizations which are grouping samples according to metadata, so if you wanted to um, group things according to, so here we had sand and sediment, if you had water samples, it splits those out and clicking on a section of the donut chart is, is, is like clicking on a taxa. So you're getting just specific information about the distribution of that specific species over the sample sites and you can click around. And again, the goal is interacting with your data. So in, in normal data sets, taxonomists can't really do this. They have static figures, they can't use their, their brain, they can't look for species of interest without really having that command line knowledge to be able to do that. So again, the goal is just to really facilitate rapid exploration. And this could be rapid exploration for um, quality control and data processing too, you know, if you wanted to filter samples, if you're trying to prep for another sequencing run. Um, and so, yeah, really we have these, these novel visuals like bubble charts which aren't really um, functioning in, in most other bioinformatics pipelines. And we also have the ability to, to hone in on specific data points. So again, this is just uh, a conceptual image of how you can click on a bubble and that shows the distribution of that species over all the samples that might be in your data set. So some have more, some have less. And I think the important part of pipelines like this is that not only does it help scientists themselves, but it also makes genomics data accessible to non-specialists. So, uh, you know, human microbiome, uh, DNA sequencing, it has a real popular appeal, you know, because of shows like CSI and, and different museum exhibits. And so there's citizen science projects out there that are generating these data sets, but are having real trouble with actually getting the data um, into the hands of their audiences in a way that the audiences can, can really play around with. So this is an example of a collaboration with um, North Carolina State where people submitted samples. They had swabbed um, different places in their homes, like dust above the door, and submitted that for sequencing, and then they had this large data set. Um, and so we're trying to work with these projects to basically generate visualizations in the Finch framework so that users or citizen scientists can basically go into the data set, find their unique code that is their home, and they can actually look at their own data and they can, you know, really Google all the taxa, all the species that they might be finding and try to inform the scientists who are trying to conduct these studies on these data sets. Um, so the reasons why we're doing this are kind of threefold. So first of all, the primary drive is really to make genomics data, make sequencing data accessible to these taxonomists or ecologists who are really never going to learn the command line. They're never going to be proficient. These are um, a lot of times more senior PIs that they just don't have the capacity. They don't have the time to learn all the, the programming skills that are needed to, to transition over to genomic data sets. But they have this incredible expertise in one or a few groups. And by developing tools that they can easily access, we can leverage their knowledge um, to a much greater extent than we are currently currently. Secondly are the, the researchers themselves, so people like me, you know, I can use the command line to process my data, but I really don't want to spend five hours regenerating static visuals. So I want to visualize my data quickly, I have um, many things to do, I have many studies that I'm working on, and it really doesn't make sense for us to have such an inefficient data analysis workflow for most routine tasks. And then thirdly, as I mentioned, you know, there's this, this broad swath of audiences out there, citizen scientists, teachers that might want to use genomics data set in their classrooms. They don't have technical experience, but they have a lot of time and they have incredible will and incredible enthusiasm for these type of data sets. So we really need to empower those people to access these data sets in a way that's not currently possible. 
And so this is, um, so we're, we've submitted a proposal for phase two funding, so this project will continue. And the goal for the next phase, now that the prototype is built, is to really go beyond what's currently possible in these frameworks. So again, we're taking text data, we're turning it into um, visuals, where shapes and patterns and colors mean something. The next phase is to um, give that more power by inserting capabilities to do web searches. So what if you could click on a bubble and you could pull up information about that species from Wikipedia, you could do image searches. You could perhaps get a, a list of species records, so where that, that species has been found around the world. There's incredible biodiversity databases housed by museums and other organizations out there that we can access. Um, and then there's gene sequences and there's scientific papers and all that's available on Google Scholar and, and um, GenBank and all these other databases. So if we could pull those into a, a central framework, we could really um, make it much easier for people to make sense out of these strings of text which are representing species names. And then for the scientists adding in the, the tools to do statistical analyses on the fly. All right, so the goals of the next phase of development are to um, expand, so incorporate new visuals. I'm particularly interested in phylogenetic trees, so add in some evolutionary relationships into the visualizations that we can do. Secondly, expand the framework to include statistical analyses, plug-in tools, so there's a, a credible work with our shiny apps nowadays and web searches, and it hopefully do this through a public API. And then the goal is really to um, build sustainability for this tool. So foster the growth of an open source user developer community. This is BSD2 license. It's all open source framework, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Um, and we really would love to grow community around the tool and get people excited about visualizing microbes. So with that, I'll just say thanks to the, uh, the guinea pigs who've tested this tool and Pitch Interactive who actually did the software engineering. And uh, I'll take any questions now or afterwards. Thank you. Why does that nematode have a spiral on it? Yeah, so that's a, it's called an amphid. They have two on the side of their head, so they're actually like Princess Leia buns, which is amazing. Evolution came up with that. Um, it's a sensory pore, so it's filled with a gel, and we think that it enables nematodes to find each other. So in every handful of sediment, there's thousands of them kind of squirming around. And they're sexually dimorphic, so there's males and females, so they need to find each other to make ne more nematodes. And we think that the, yeah, the, the amphids, those spirals, are actually playing a role in that. It's chemosensory. Thank you for sharing the work. I'm curious, uh, um, I, I really like the artist um, um, kind of uh, metaphor you mentioned. I'm curious if you show this to, to artists or designers, I'm curious what they think about. And also I'm curious what are some of the traditional tech, technomists, I don't know, the, uh, what, what do you think about? Because when I see some of the drawings you, you show early on, I feel a, a kind of um, connection with that drawing. But when I see a bubble chart, it's just a bubble chart. Uh, I don't feel the artistic uh, kind of connection with that. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think the taxonomists would probably have the opposite reaction because they, whenever I show this tool to them, they get super excited by bubble charts because it's just not a part of our normal workflow. So um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you that we need to think about that and I would love to work with fine artists and they actually have some on staff at Pinch, Pinch, Pitch Interactive. So it's, it's been kind of a, um, something we've been working on. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a bubble chart. It could be little images of what the species might actually look like. Um, I know that's a lot harder from a software engineering perspective, but I think that uh, the door is wide open on coming up with novel ways where we can pay homage to taxonomy and the historical side of things, but also embrace the technology and, and what it can offer. Great, thank you.